Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome to our church service this week. My name is Colin and I'm the worship coordinator here at Clearview Church. Um, our church, Clearview, we've, we have these, these things called the three pillars. Uh, the three pillars are worshiping, discipling, and blessing. Uh, and you would have, you know, you've, you've probably seen them around the church building. It's on the, the big wall in the worship center that we meet in normally on Sunday mornings. Uh, and I just want to kind of touch base on those for a sec. Uh, and maybe challenge you how what does that what does that look like for you right now so worshiping uh worshiping is where we're you know we're recognize we're recognizing our spot in front of god uh you know we're recognizing how great he is how awesome he is how powerful he is uh we're, we're singing his praises we're doing uh, you know we're giving him glory in in all the various ways that we can do that um discipling is you know where are you taking the next step in following jesus in following god where is he leading us uh, and his blessing piece is recognizing that that God has blessed us so that we can go and bless others uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, and I know that, you know, in this time of COVID where we're, where we're kind of at home, we're in isolation, we're not really seeing each other, um, this can be a weird time um, for us as Christians. You know, maybe we, we really miss worshiping with other people. Uh, maybe we really miss our small groups uh, and our families that are, you know, working uh, with us on our discipleship journey. Uh, maybe we've kind of lost some opportunities for volunteering and giving and helping out. Um, but I want to encourage you that there are still very, you know, there's still so many different ways of getting involved and doing that kind of stuff. I think what I'm trying to say is that there are still so many ways to get involved and to keep growing. This isn't a time where everything is on pause, including, you know, our spiritual journey. Um, I know for myself, it's been, you know, it's been difficult. You know, I'm not surrounded by... Um, you know, hundreds of uh, fellow Christians worshiping every week. I'm kind of, you know, sitting here in my living room watching the service uh, on the TV, and it's, it's just different, right? Um, but there's still, you know, God is still inviting us into a new place with Him. He's still inviting us to grow closer. As a staff, we've been meeting every week, and we're trying to continually, you know, figure out what are some more things that we can do? What are some ways that we can keep people connected and keep people involved? Uh, and so Elaine, our discipleship director, she's been coming up with a bunch of different things. Uh, you would have seen the rocks. I'm going to actually put the rocks up on the screen right now. Uh, these rocks are uh, what we call the, the scripture stones. Uh, and, you know, as we were reading and reflecting on pieces of scripture, uh, we were encouraged to go outside and to grab a rock and to, uh, you know, write out what this piece of scripture is saying to us. Um, you know, draw it out. Um, yeah, there's some beautiful examples here. Uh, this week we've got another opportunity. It's kind of a silly one. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say you're going to have to check the e-news and, and see what that's all about. We've got an exciting service this morning, uh, so I encourage you to grab a coffee, uh, you know, have a seat, get cozy. Join me as we pray over our service this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in my home. You are welcome in my heart. God, I know that we're, we're grieving this, this loss of community right now, um, and we're waiting for it to be over. Uh, but God, may you grant us peace and understanding in this time. Uh, may we begin to understand that you're still working in this time, um, that you have stuff for us to learn, um, that you're constantly inviting us deeper into relationship with you, God. God, I know this is, a, this is maybe a weird image, but... May your Holy Spirit fill our screens this morning. Uh, you know, whether we're watching this on a TV or a laptop or a tablet or a phone or whatever, um, Holy Spirit, may you just penetrate our Wi-Fi, our internet, God. Uh, may you connect us like never before. God, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's Colleen here. I hope you're doing well. This week I was talking to somebody who's not doing so well. He's really struggling with having a sense of purpose, waking up feeling like life is meaningless because he lost his job. This morning I was reading from Revelation the reason that we were created. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things created us and we exist because you created what you pleased you were pleased with us let's look for ways to be creative 
in our expression of worship each day. This is a song we like to sing, A Lion and the Lamb. We'd like to teach you a new song. It's called The Blessing. It's sung, being sung all over the world right now. Join me as you get comfortable with it. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face 
toward you and give you peace. Let's sing that again. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn Oh. 
morning, Clearview family. I really, really miss you a lot, seeing you on Sunday mornings. This is not fun. Anyways, my name is Annie Berkshoff. I'm a deacon at our Clearview Church. And today, instead of passing a basket up and down the pews to collect your donations, I'm just going to be giving you an introduction to our offering today. Our offering is for World Renew, which is a ministry of our denomination which provides aid in disaster areas around the world and works with communities to renew hope, reconcile lives, and restore creation. Today, Mother's Day, is World Renew's official Maternal and Child Health Sunday. My husband Harry and I, while on a World Renew assignment in Zambia in 2013, received an eye-opening exposure to maternal child issues we learned about stunting, which affects 40% of all children in Zambia. Children who suffer from stunting are too short for their age and often underweight. Their brains do not receive nutrition at the most critical stages of growth, resulting in impaired growth and development and diminished mental ability. This nutritional challenge can begin from the moment of conception to birth outcome. The cycle continues with low birth weight and limited access to nutritional foods. The Project World Renew implemented in Zambia emphasized nutrition to women during pregnancy and for children under five. The plan included providing seeds, instructions for kitchen gardening, and group cooking classes using a variety of nutritional foods. We witnessed some of these classes and were encouraged to sample some of the results. They were so proud of their accomplishments. The project also asked women to bring their children to be weighed and measured every month. Accurate notes were kept to chart the growth progress of the children. There was rejoicing at the improvement each month. Today, Many of us are so very sad to be missing out on physical visits and hugs from our children and grandchildren. This is a difficult time, really difficult time for all of us. We can, however, feel some joy at knowing that we can bless mothers in World Renew projects like this one in Zambia, where trained local health volunteers walk alongside new mothers at every stage to provide them and their children with safety, care, and hope. Perhaps you can, with physical distancing, honor your mother with a gift that helps to protect the health of mothers and babies in places of extreme poverty. Good morning, Clearview. My name is Jeremy. And I'm a deacon at the church. Uh, I was asked to do today's congregational prayer. Uh, I'll be honest, it's something I've never done before. So I've got it on my phone here. I'll be reading it off there. I hope you guys don't mind that. Uh, so let's get started. Lord, we thank you for this day and for another opportunity to gather as a church to worship. Again, we come with many questions and few answers as we continue to face this unprecedented situation. We're all affected in different ways. Please be with each one of us. We pray for those that are sick and for those who have loved ones that are struggling. Please be of comfort to them. We also lift up those that face other uncertainty, whether it's with employment or finances during this difficult time. We pray for those that are alone in isolation May they feel your presence. We also thank you for your continued, your continued care in this time. Thank you for our families, mothers in particular, on this Mother's Day. Thank you for health workers on the front line, for food banks and other community programs that are providing for those in need during such a crucial period. We thank you for our church community, for a congregation of people that supports one another, pandemic or not, Thank you for our church leaders that continue to guide us through this time. We pray for guidance in our pastoral search. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Eric and Pastor Joe. We 
you for their dedication to our church and their continued efforts in weeks to come. As we continue our mission, we pray that you continue to guide them on their journey. We pray for our search committee as they move forward. May they be, uni may they be united and in tune with you. And may we continue to support them through this process. We pray for our church outreach programs, which are also affected in this challenging time. We continue to pray for the Food for Life program and for those in the Clear B community. Please be with our youth programs and their leadership and for the youth themselves, as they are also dealing with unprecedented times. Again, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to meet and pray that you'll continue to sustain us. Please be with us for the rest of this day the coming week. We pray this in your name. Amen. The gospel reading this morning is from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14, and I'm reading from the New American Standard. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of Jesus were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. And so they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he had stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about a hundred yards, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. And all together there were so many yet the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, for knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. And this is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. May God grant us understanding. This is a little warmer, and a little more comfortable, and not nearly so windy. The passage of scripture that I just read, um, John makes reference at the beginning and sets the scene that they're at the Sea of Tiberias. And the Sea of Tiberias is the Sea of Galilee, otherwise known as the Sea of Galilee. John only makes mention of it three times in uh, his gospel. He refers uh, to it the first time, early in the Gospel, as the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. And then the next two times, he refers to it as the Sea of Tiberias each time, and this, this third time uh, here in chapter 21. And um, he sets the scene, and then he tells us who's there. Simon Peter, the one who denied Jesus. Thomas, the twin, the one who doubted him. Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel, who's mentioned at the beginning of John, John chapter 1, and, and is mentioned in Jesus calling the disciples, and that Philip had 
called Nathaniel and said, you should come and, and meet Jesus. And Nathaniel's famous response, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then when Jesus meets him, he says to Nathaniel, you're the one in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel, how do you know me? Oh, I, I saw you before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree. And Nathaniel's immediate response, teacher, rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now, we don't know why he responded the way he did. We don't know what that meant, but that's Nathaniel's introduction. And Jesus' response to Nathaniel at that time in the beginning of chapter one of, of the Gospel of John is essentially, you ain't seen nothing yet. And, and so this, is, this character again is brought back in the very last story here. Um, and we've gone through all of the, the account of the Gospel of John in, in between those, that introduction and then this last story that includes Nathaniel. Nathaniel was from Cana in Galilee. Of course, Cana is the story that's in the second chapter of John, where Cana is, is this place where Jesus performed his first miracle, this wedding celebration. And, and it's the, the miracle of the abundance of wine and Jesus turning water into wine. Um, and so it's, again, it's this invoking of the abundance of Jesus. And John is very careful to set these characters here in this story and to make sure we know them, to flag them and to remind us all through the story of his gospel. And, um, and then he mentions the sons of Zebedee, James and John. John, who is writing this, um, the, the writer, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then he says there were two other unnamed disciples, two other disciples. And I think that's really interesting. I don't, we don't know who they were. We know, okay, there are seven. Seven of the remaining 11 are there. The fishermen, probably, of the crowd and and these two that are mentioned that are there are are they are they you and me are can we can we hold on to that as we enter into the story and try to draw ourselves or allow ourselves to be drawn into the story and to experience the story ourselves as well they're fishing all night they're out all night and Jesus calls to them after they've caught nothing. And he basically says to them, children, do you have something that might go with some bread? That's, that's apparently the literal translation of, of what he says to them. And they say no. He calls them children. It's kind of like if the boss walks into a staff meeting and says, okay, kids, um, it's, it's this very informal light jibe at them a little bit and they say no they haven't caught anything and he tells them to cast their nets to the right over the right hand side of the boat which seems a little odd when I think about it I think like well what difference does it make and maybe they would why wouldn't they have been casting their nets to both sides of the boat anyway but of course if I think about it okay if, if we're assuming that most of them, that all of them are right-handed, because most of them would be people, people then, they, they, they worked on using their right hand, then uh, left-handedness was maybe not as common back then. And so if they're right-handed, if they throw right, they're throwing across their body this way, if they throw, if I swing right, if I swing a bat, if I, if I pick up a golf club, so let's say I pick up this golf club here and I'm going to I'm going to swing I'm going to swing this way right if I it's a baseball bat I'm swinging this way if I'm hockey if I'm throwing a net I'm going to throw it to my left I'm going to throw across this way that's going to be a stronger throw He tells them to throw to the right side of the boat they're going to have to throw 
with their weaker, it's going to be a weaker throw. It's not going to get the net as far or as broad. But they do it. They do what he asked them to do. And they cast the net to the right-hand side of the boat, which is counterintuitive, and it's awkward. And then, in the story, there are so many fish. There are so many fish that they can barely pull the net up. And in that moment of the abundance of the fish, of so many, they recognize him. John recognizes him, and John is the first one who speaks his name out loud, who says, it's the Lord. Now, Peter reacts right away and pulls on his clothes. He covers himself. He, he throws himself into the sea, and he gets to shore first. But Peter is, is, is an emotional yo-yo. He he's pulling his clothes on and throwing himself in the water, which is going to weigh him down. Luckily, he's only 100 yards from shore, and he gets to shore. The others are pulling this massive net in that is so full. And Jesus says to Peter, go and bring some fish. So then Peter, who's back up, who's on the shore, is back toward the boat, and he's gathering up some fish, and he's pulling the net in. And it's then that it says that there are 153 large fish. And they know it's him. It's Jesus. They know, they know it's him. It's, it's like the two at, at Emmaus in Luke. They see him, they recognize him, and they know it's him. No one asks him who he is. They just know. And I, I kind of understand that. They don't want to say anything to him. They just, they don't want to get it wrong. Jesus has been popping in and out and showing up whenever and they never know when he's going to show up. And maybe they just don't want to blow it. They don't want to break the spell. They, they don't want him to leave so abruptly again. And he just gently invites them to breakfast. And they eat. And all this post-resurrection, all these stories, all these stories of Jesus after the resurrection. In all of them, the disciples' core state of emotions is revealed. None of the stories of the resurrection show the disciples in any kind of virtuous state particularly. They're not pious. They're not prayerful. They're fearful. And they're cowering and they're hiding, they're disbelieving, they're, they're doubting, they're distrustful, distrustful of each other and of their own experience. They insist on the fulfillment of their preconditions before they will trust each other. They're suspicious and they're confused. They believe, though some doubt. They're competitive with each other. I mean, John, the younger one, outruns the older Peter as they are rushing to the reportedly empty tomb. He doesn't wait for him. They're, they're not together in any of this. Peter gets there and passes him. They're perplexed. They're downcast. They're depressed. They're snipey and self-absorbed and... Cleopas on the road to Emmaus is, is irritable and grumpy with this stranger who doesn't know what's been going on. They are overjoyed when they experience that it's Jesus. They're overjoyed, it says, wait for it. They're overjoyed to the point of disbelief. They were locked up and locked down. They're not merely locked inside their house. They were locked inside their hearts. And even if they went out to the shores of Lake Tiberias, they were still locked up. Hiding and lonely and nervous. Even after they had experienced the resurrected Lord, they were still 
despondent and despairing. They were afraid of other people, what other people would think of them, what harm might come to them from other people. These fears that they had were not misplaced fears. None of their fears were misplaced. They were reasonable and evidence-based emotional responses, every single one of these ones that I've mentioned. So why, why are we so quick to beat ourselves up when we feel the same way, the same things, and similar experiences? Why do we pretend that we don't feel the same way that the disciples felt? Why do we pretend that they're somehow so different from us? These stories, these stories, John says, are here so that we might believe and have life in his name. These stories are here to help us trust. They're precisely because the disciples don't trust, they don't have it all together, that these stories help me to trust. Because I can see myself in these stories. I can see myself in these people. In the doubt and the fear and the loneliness and the uncertainty. And in this case, wanting everything to just go back to normal. Because when I'm in the middle of my fear, my uncertainty, I, I look to things that I can trust. I'm looking for something that I can trust. And so I'm looking for things to go back the way I understand them. Now, if we think about that story and how it is that we learn from that story, well, let's think a little bit about what it is that John might be trying to teach us. What are the lessons that we can learn here? Well, they lived in an empire and we live in an empire. They lived in a world that said, we will take care of you and we have got everything that you need and we will provide for you. We will provide you with safety and security and in return, you will give us your devotion and you will give us your imagination. Empires put their names on things, and the empire can put their name on the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus is the Word, as John says. Jesus is the Word made flesh. The one in whom all creation is made. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him nothing was made. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only one begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In him was light and that light was the light, life of all people. And so he is the one here, Jesus, again, is the one at the end of this story. In the resurrection story, it is Jesus who stands on the shores of Galilee, and it is he who will provide the abundance of her waters, not Caesar. It is he who will calm and command her waves. It is he who will call forth the abundance of his creation. And... <clears throat> when we want things to go back to normal, just like they did, they're, they've gone through this crushing disappointment followed quickly by this, the exultant exuberance of, of the resurrection and a reordering of the way all things were, which they completely don't understand, and then they're just told to wait, and they wait. And, well, the other lesson learned here is we don't do waiting very well. And they didn't do waiting well, and neither do we. We just, we're not wired for that. We, we, we're doers, we, we want to do things, we want to get things going. 
and we want things to be consistent and normal. These disciples are all a cross-section of emotional reactions. Peter, he mentions by name, denial, Thomas, doubt, Nathaniel, dismissal, but also a very quick acceptance. And then the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, but also the disciple whom Jesus loved. These disciples all share disappointment and uncertainty in their future. All of these emotions, all of these things, all of this picture of humanity is brought together again in this last chapter of John, in this story of the resurrection, this whole description of what it is to be human. What else do we learn? Jesus shows up unexpectedly. It's always unexpected. We never summon Jesus. And he meets us in our state, whatever we're in. Our uncertainty and our disappointment, our inability to wait well. Jesus meets us. He meets them and he's unrecognized again. They don't recognize him. Mary didn't recognize him. The two in Emmaus on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him. And we don't recognize him. When Jesus shows up, we won't recognize him. We'll miss him more often than we'll see him. But he shows up. And he meets us in the middle of our insistence on trying to make things go back to normal. He meets us there in that insistence of ours to try to return to normal. But things can't go back to normal. He knows that. And he knows that when we do try to return things to normal, when we've tasted the resurrection, we've tasted that life, and he, but we want things to go back to normal. We want things to go back to the way they were, to a sense of control. The experience is going to be empty. There's not going to be anything there. There's nothing for them. It's pointless for them to try to go back to do what they used to do. Now Jesus, when he shows up, he doesn't wipe away their fears. The numb return to what they've always known, what they've always done. He says, okay, you want to go back to normal? but there is no normal. You want to go home, but you know you can't really go back. You know that. When we go back, it won't be to normal. It can't be the same, or it was all for nothing. It will be empty and meaningless if we try. When they go back, he asks them to do something that is counterintuitive. And when we go back, he will ask us to do the same. He'll ask us to throw to our weak side, to do something that doesn't play to our strengths, that doesn't, that doesn't play to what we know we're good at and what, we're all, what we already know how to do. He'll ask us, to throw to our weak side, to go against the grain, to do something that places us in a position of weakness that feels awkward and strange and feels out of place. It's not what we've always done. We can't do what we always did before, that always worked before, because it's not working now and it won't work. But if we will do that, if we will be obedient to him and throw to our weak side, do something that places ourselves in a position of weakness where we know that it's not because of our own strength. He will give from his abundance in a way that we couldn't possibly imagine. 
And we will have a moment when we do that where we might recognize that it's him. We might see in that that this is not from us. This is not us. And this is not a fluke. That there is something of Jesus' presence in this. An abundance that we couldn't have imagined. And we'll recognize that it's from Jesus and it's not from our own strength. And in that, we will recognize him. And he'll provide for us. And he'll feed us. And he'll give us what we need. Just like he fed them. How many times in the resurrection stories does food figure as an element in those stories? It's, there's not that many stories of Jesus appearing and several of them do. The two on the road to Emmaus, they sit down to a meal, they invite him in, they give him hospitality. And then when he shows up to the, to the disciples and they can't quite accept that it's him and they can't, they're, they're, they're so overjoyed that they can't believe it, that, that they, it's actually disbelief. And his response to them is, do you have anything to eat? Can you give me something to eat? The food again, and he eats a piece of fish in their presence. And that food again is part of confirming the resurrection. And then in this story, he feeds them. He gives them breakfast. They've been working all night. They've been up all night doing something pointless and empty. And at the end of it, he feeds them after he's provided for them. But he feeds them. He gives them what they need. And he lets them contribute something out of his abundance. He lets them contribute something to what he feeds them. Jesus, in all of the stories of the resurrection, he doesn't just remove our emotional distress. He doesn't just take it away. He doesn't, it doesn't just evaporate in the presence of Jesus. He meets them in the middle of their despair and their loneliness and their fear and their resentment and their uncertainty and their doubt and their distrust. He meets them in the middle of all of that and he fills that emptiness. He fills that empty place with his abundance and his presence. It's not always easy or simple, but this is in fact how we come to believe this is, in fact, how our experiences of the resurrected Christ, looking for him in the middle of our despair and our loneliness and our uncertainty and our fear of the future and our unsureness of each other, our reluctance to trust each other and to trust what the others say, our, our fear of hope, our fear of hoping for something bigger and better than just things returning to normal. This is how we come to believe. Jesus comes and meets us in those experiences and in all of those emotions and all of those feelings. He meets us there and he fills those feelings. He doesn't remove them. He doesn't take them away. And so this is how we come to life. This is how we come to know. Not just in those stories that happened 2,000 years ago on the shores of Lake Tiberias and in Jerusalem and on the road to Emmaus and in a garden, but in our lives in the places that are empty in our own lives, 
in our own need to want to return to something that we can control, in our own desire to live into something that is not the fullness of life that God wants for us. To just put our heads down and get through it. But the psalmist said in Psalm 65, those who dwell in the ends of the earth shall stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. You visit the earth and cause it to overflow and you greatly enrich it. Amen. 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 And so, let us lean into that, into these resurrection stories that are still with us now, looking for him when he shows up, asking us to do something in the middle of our emptiness, something counterintuitive, something that doesn't play to our strength but creates an opportunity for his abundance. Amen. fear. The Lord is the defense of our life. Whom shall we dread? 
the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide on all of us as we wait for the Lord. Be strong and take courage in your heart. Yes, wait for the Lord. Amen.